This video is a review of the Many Electron Atoms chapter of the Quantum Chemistry and Spectroscopy playlist. So we start off by defining atomic units, where a lot of the common physical constants that show up in our equations are going to be set equal to 1, including the mass of the electron, charge of the electron, h bar, and 4 pi epsilon naught. This gives us the ground state energy of the hydrogen 1s orbital as being equal to zero, minus 0 0.5 Hartree, the atomic unit of energy. For the helium atom, our Hamiltonian is going to be the kinetic energy of each electron in atomic units minus 1 half del 1 squared, minus 1 half del 2 squared, plus their attraction to the nucleus, minus 2 over r1, minus 2 over r2 plus their repulsion from one another, 1 over R12. The Hartree-Fock energy, which we'll discuss below for the helium atom, then becomes minus 2.8617 Hartree. What's called the second-order perturbation theory energy will be minus 2.9033, and those, among other approximations, are various ways to approach the ex true experimental energy of the helium atom, which is minus 2.9077 Hartrees. To help us understand the wave functions of atoms with multiple electrons, we also need to understand the anti-symmetry principle, where whenever we exchange two electrons in our wave function, like going from psi 1, 2 to psi 2, 1, the wave function needs to switch sign. And this leads to the Pauli exclusion principle, where we can only have one electron with each kind of spin in each spatial orbital. So we can't have two electrons that are spin up in the same orbital because that would violate the anti-symmetry principle as, as predicted in the Pauli exclusion principle. Our wave function then, in order to satisfy this, is going to be what's called a Slater determinant where every electron is going to be in every orbital to make them indistinguishable, and we normalize this by 1 over the square root of the number of electrons factorial on the outside of this determinant. So the typical method we can use to try to estimate the energies of atoms and their electrons is what's called Hartree-Fock theory. So we have a wave function for each orbital that each electron is in, it's going to be a sum over all of our basis functions, phi nu, time of their uh, coefficients, their variational coefficients, c nu i. Each of these gives us an atomic orbital, which combined we put into a Slater determinant to give our total atomic wave function. So the Hartree-Fock energy has some different components. For each electron, we have a hi integral, which is its kinetic energy and attraction to the nucleus. And then we have what's called the mean field, which is how electrons interact with one another. We have what are called J integrals, Coulomb integrals, which are the repulsion of the charge densities of electron I and electron J. And we have the exchange integrals, which arise due to the fact that our wave function is this Slater determinant to satisfy the anti-symmetry principle. We then have what's called the Fock operator, which when acting on each orbital, gives the orbital energy for that electron. And we get the Hartree-Fock equations, which in matrix form look like Fc equals Esc, with each uh, energy of each orbital being approximately equal to the ionization potential of that orbital. We can also go beyond Hartree-Fock, including what's called correlation energy. And so there are various types of methods that go beyond Hartree-Fock, including things like density functional theory, second order Mahler plus a perturbation theory, coupled cluster theory, going on a hierarchy of our method and size of basis set until we can get to the exact solution. But typically Hartree-Fock with some moderate size basis set is good enough for qualitative answers. We can use these to look at electron configurations of various kinds of atoms like krypton, giving us the familiar general chemistry 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, etc. And for a given configuration, we can represent those states by what are called atomic term symbols. So just as we mentioned for the hydrogen atom, you have 2 times s plus 1, the multiplicity, 1 being a singlet, 2 being a doublet, triplet, quartet, etc. L being the uh, orbital quantum, or the orbital angular momentum number, whether that's going to be s, p, d, etc. Explaining how to do that in each individual video. And then the value of J allowed for the values of L and S, giving us term symbols like singlet D2, 
triplet P0, doublet D3 halves, etc. Once we have our term symbols, we can use Hun's rule to rank which of them are lowest or highest in energy. So the things that are lowest in energy are the ones with the largest S, so a triplet below a singlet. If they're the same uh, multiplicity, the ones with the larger L are going to be more stable. So singlet P is lower than singlet S. And then lastly, looking at J, if we're more than half filled in our, in our subshell, we look for the largest J. And if we're less than half filled, we are looking for the smallest J. So then lastly, we can look at atomic spectra based off the ordering of these term symbols with the selection rules that delta S equals zero. Delta L is plus or minus one or zero. Unless, uh, it's, unless L is zero, then we can't go to another zero. And such is the same rule for J as well. Links to each of these individual videos in the on-screen annotations and in the description as well.